Florida, it is like home away from home. It's like a family. And so I am very, very privileged uh, uh, not just to know Pastor Meyer, but to look up to him and have a relationship with him, his church. Again, wonderful blessing. We're going to be blessed tonight. Let's give Pastor Meyer a nice round of applause as he comes. the Lord. Well, Friday already. Gone quick. You know, the theme of being radical, uh, I want to uh, just share something that's on my heart. You know, when we are young, we're bold, sometimes there's just too much bull in the china closet. And we have to be careful. Can you say amen? Because there can be something that you think is radical, uh, but many times you see this steady uh, people, uh, these people that have weathered all kinds of things, still here, still going. Let me tell you something, that's radical, not to start, but to keep going and go through whatever there ever is. God has put something on my heart I want to share with you tonight, because this week there's a number of people, you've come to this conference and your hearts are very heavy. You are steeped with very, very desperate questions in need of answers. You even said in your heart of hearts, God, I'm coming, but I really need you to speak to me. I need to meet with you. God, I feel like it's an either make it or break it moment in my life. And so you have thought, you know, this storm has got to be over. And when you thought it was over, it wasn't. When it then moved into a season, you said, well, this season has to be over. And it wasn't. You know, there's a lot of times people don't talk about real, genuine Christianity, living the Christian life and the Christian ministry. And so I want to think about this because tonight, in all reality, there's pastors here, there's pastors' wives, there's long-term church members, there's all kinds of marriages, old and young, there's pastors' kids, older teenagers. There are those that are saying, but what about me? God, do you hear me? Do you see me? God, I really need to meet with you. God, I need to see you. I need some answers. And so if we're not careful, those feelings of frustration can lead us into feelings of alienation. And you begin to cry, maybe not outward, because how many know we want to put on our best presentation, but inside there's a cry. God, where are you? Why can't I see you? Why can't I hear you? Why can't I find you? And so you're living right, you're working hard, you're faithful, you're doing your very, very best. But sometimes you don't see the results that you hope for. Sometimes you don't see the fruit of your labor. Sometimes you don't see God reward your diligence. And inside, there's this deep question. There's this heaviness of heart. God, where are you? God, I can't see you. I can't find you. And so we ask sometimes, God, why aren't things happening? We question, am I doing something wrong? We question even, God, is there something I'm not seeing? Some have even questioned, God, are you mad at me? Others, one pastor just I talked to recently shocked me, and he said, am I cursed? One pastor told me, he was a friend of mine a few years ago, he said, I've passed out 10,000 flyers. Nobody got saved. Nobody came to church. And brother, it's not the first time. Why is that? Now, it's getting quiet in here, isn't it? Because uh, anyway, this, there's no goosebumps when it comes down to sometimes the reality of what we're going to talk about here tonight. Amen. You know, I thank God for the times we shout, we yell, and rejoice. But how many know there's other times and seasons and moments in life that we really, really need for God to help us and teach us something there? There are moments when His will can be frustrating. There are moments when his methods can be difficult to understand. There are moments when it seems just so, so way too long. There are moments when we say, God, why is a good God like you letting these things happen to me? Why is that, God? Is there really a reason for all of this? And if there's anybody that can relate to all of this and even more, it's probably Job. Most people I know, when you're really going through some hard, difficult times, why do we turn to that book? And that man, Job, how did you make it through it? How did you survive? How did you deal with these things? How did you even come out the other end of that? 
But I thought about Job, and Job can teach us something tonight if our hearts would be open, and we wouldn't be afraid to pull off the masks and all the personas and just really bear our real hearts to God. Because there's a lot of us, we've had a great, great, uh, uh, you know, conference, message after message after message, and you're feeling pretty good right now, but some of you are saying, but you know what? The reality, i got to go home to some real messes. I've got to go home to some real battles. I've got to go back to a place where I haven't seen a lot happen. I've got to deal with some very difficult and tangled things. God, I need to meet with you. God, I need you to speak to me. I believe Job can help us with this. Think about Job. When it starts about Job, something that really tangles my mind is Job is going to be the center of a conversation between the devil and God. The devil and God are going to get involved in something we're going to read in just a little bit about Job. Think about this. When God points out the greatest man living clean, amen, his best example, and he tells the devil, hey, have you considered my servant Job? How many would definitely, don't, don't, don't say that about me. <laughs> have you considered my pioneer pastor? Have you considered that pastor's wife? Have you considered those pastor's kids? Have you considered that missionary? And this is a conversation that's going on between God and the devil that blows my mind. Sometimes the hype has to get flattened. Are you with me, somebody? In some real reality. Because he is doing something. He is going to get involved. The demonic is going to have some liberty, going to have some privileges. Why, for all this, whatever we think, the courage of God, why don't you just smack him down, take his bottom lip, pull it over his skull, and then kick his kneecaps off. He could do that. But instead, he said, have you considered you? Okay, see, I get it, guys. I get it. I love to hear this shouting. Yeah, we're going to. I hear you. And, uh, but time, reality of life, the real enemy. This is a reality. See, I don't want to just start. I don't want to just say some right things. I need God to speak to me, to show me, and to help me. When my heart is aching, I'm desperate. I am literally just saturated with the questions. Because there are times when you don't really see God, hear God, or feel God. And I know you don't like to talk about that, but it's real. There's times when you ask God, God, if you're real and for me, when you go through things, God, you're a God who loves me. I know that, but why are you letting these things happen to me? Can we let Job help us tonight in this place? So here he is. Here's this discussion. Here's the involvement of God in the devil. And all of a sudden, seemingly out of nowhere, Job's entire life, his world is turned upside down. It's like life and all the living is just removed from underneath of him. Greatest man on the earth. And so 23 chapters later, how many know it's okay in the first chapter, but we got some chapters to go. 23 chapters later, Job is going to speak something and share something. And I hope our hearts are open, our ears attentive to listen something. Because it wasn't easy for Job. He wasn't bulletproof, somebody. Don't think that we're bulletproof. If Jesus' perfection in the flesh can be under so much stress, he sweats drops of blood through the pores of his skin. Don't act like that can never happen to you and I that are far from being perfect. Job says these words, Job 23, verse 8 and 9. He says, look, I go forward, but he, God, is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. Verse 9, when he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. And when he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. I want to talk with you a moment about the left hand experience. The left hand experience is far more than just stories. These are not stories. These are real people in real situations, in real hardship, in real danger. This is something that is real. Are you with me? That even some of the best believers, the closest to God, 
had to get some answers, had to find something in God when that was very difficult to do. Think about this. My question, so why would Job, who is desperately seeking God, he is seeking God for direction and God's location, why would he segregate the left-hand side? In other words, why would he add something more when, or other translation, where God's work, why would he add something more when he talks about the left-hand side? Prior scripture tells us a little bit about Job. Job's been complaining. Don't lift your hands, but how many of you have done some godly complaining? He is battling with bitterness, not against somebody else. He's bitter at God. Okay. I'll confess, I've been time, I'm really mad at you, God. He wants to bring his case. One of the reasons he wants to find God is he wants to spill his case. I want to talk to you, God, about some things. I've got some arguments behind these lips. I really want to meet with you. I need to get some answers. I feel enough is enough. I feel this is wrong. He has been good. He's been doing right. Are you with me, somebody? The most righteous man in his time, the most favored, the most blessed, the most protected, the most provided for, is asking God, why are you letting this happen to me? Are people living clean here? Are you doing your best? You're praying and you're believing God, but here he is. He's saying, God, I'm upset. I'm battling bitterness. There's arguments behind these lips. Why are you letting something like this happen to me? Why would you allow this? Or at least, God, if you don't fix it, explain it. So let's try to think about Job if we can for just a moment. And by the way, amen, this won't be sober forever. There's a good story at the end of this, so hang on a little bit. Here's Job right here. Think about him. Here's the greatest man among the people. And here's the wealthiest man that now is bankrupt. His entire finances are obliterated. You lose the job a little bit and let's guess you'll stay home for weeks. Everything that he worked for, he saved up and he accomplished. In a moment's time, it's gone. Think about this. No cattle. No donkeys, no oxen, they're all gone. 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 donkeys, a large number of his servants, they're all gone. I can't imagine what that would feel like. Everything I've worked for, everything I've accomplished, everything that has been advanced and even set in place for my future, amen, of my family, even the blessings of God that you've given me, in a moment's time, it's all gone. I'm not getting one amen out of this right here. <laughs> Who does he turn to? He couldn't turn to his wife. She too was so broken, she despised the very breath that he breathed. He couldn't turn to his children. Why? They're all gone. All ten kids, seven sons, three daughters, all gone. He couldn't turn to his friends because when he did, they said, Job, it's probably your fault anyway. You're probably to blame for all of this. And just when you think it can't get worse, it did. Then he becomes ill. So ill, he's scraping sores on his body with broken pieces of pottery. And he is reminded every day of the state that he is now in by the stench of his own body. I don't think he's surrounded by hallelujahs. I never hear him share God is good all the time, in time, any time. But Job can help us. And we need to let him help us because this frustration will lead to feelings of alienation. In other words, I'm all alone. So much is gone. This is always one of Satan's tricks. Remember, he's going before God. He said, there's only a reason why he serves you. Let me remove these things and he'll renounce you. How many know God always knows you better than the devil could even <laughs> contemplate? Satan wants you to think that help is not coming. That there's no hope. He wants you to think and move you into hopelessness because that hopelessness will produce anxiety. Anxiety will then bring you into overwhelming despair. 
And then you can become so despaired, you're now gripped with that sinking feeling, God, I can't find you. I've been saved 40 years. They just did a, uh, a party for me being saved 40 years, 34 years of ministry. And there's a lot of good memories. There's a lot of good battles that were won pretty quickly, but there's a lot of right here what I want to share with you. Are you with me? The problem was Job could not find God where he most expected to find God. 34 years of ministry, I've had to experience this. This left-hand experience has changed my life, and it's changed my ministry. There are times when I have been upset in my prayer closet. Nobody's around. Nobody can hear me, but I'm saying, God, I'm upset. Where is the God that commands an earthquake into the valley of dry bones and puts all that broken piece back together? Where's the God of clay that puts all of these things remolded? Where's that God? Where's the God of my Bible? Where's that God? And where's that God right now? Job asked when I look forward, where is the God who goes before me? We ask if God be before me, who could be against me? Well, it doesn't seem like that right now. Where is that God? Are you with me, somebody? And he says, listen. He's saying, I don't see God. I don't see any sign of his coming. I see no sign of God up ahead of me. Job said he's not there. And it's terrifying when you can't see God. And sometimes you don't see any change ahead of you. Then Job says, when I look backward, I don't see him there either. My trail, my history with God, the history of God's faithfulness to me, I can't see him there. The God who has already helped me so much, where is he now? I can't see him there either. He then shifts, he looks at the right side. He couldn't see God on the right side, especially the right side. We know the right side always symbolizes power and strength. David said, God has delivered me by his mighty right hand. We know Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer. Are you with me? Somebody sits at the right hand of God. Why can't I see him at that right hand of all power and authority and rule? I can't see him there. Job is saying, where is that God? I can't see him. I can't find him there. This is where he's supposed to be. This is where he's supposed to show up in his power and his authority and his rule. Secondly, Job reveals a secret of the left-hand experience. This is what I really want to share with you. It's rough at first, but I'm telling you, it's life-changing. Hallelujah, when you come out. Job says the left hand is where, other translation, when God works. Job is saying there's something more on the left hand or the left hand side. The left hand always symbolizes, uh, amen, the least expected side. It symbolizes to you and I, amen, it's known to refer the clumsy side, the unlucky side, the unreasonable side, the side of being feeble and weak, the side of being less used. Around the world, the left side is known as the darkest side, the awkward side of things. The Latin word for left means sinister or the side of opposition. Even the old farmer's almanac says, evil has a left hand. Left hand handshake is considered in the world as an insult. Why? Because it is meant to symbolize emptiness and weakness. So Job feels the left side is the least expected place. He didn't expect to find God there. It was the least of all places. Yet he says something he wants to share to you and I. There is something he wants to add more. He pauses. He segregates. I couldn't find him before me on the right or behind me, but I want to add something more. Even though I couldn't see him, the left side is when and where he works. Least expected side. Job, as difficult as it seemed and it was, he points out a secret. Somehow this side, he says, is when and where God's work even especially when you can't see him. Like Job, many people have to learn the secret of the left-hand experience. Think about this. You know, we have a lot of reports. I wonder sometimes, because you know me, I put on plays and stuff, and, and I'm really into that. And Can you imagine if we had a report 
We'd like to have Daniel chapter 3, the three Hebrew young men come up and give a report. Tell us what it was like when you went into that fiery furnace. They were living right. They were living clean. They were testimonies. They were young people that were staying the course. They were not compromising with the world's delicacies. They weren't bowing in cowardice. Can you say amen to all the demanded images of their day? No, no, no. They were right with God, incredible in conviction and covenant. In all of that, people get mad. The spirit of the devil gets mad working through people. Not everybody likes it that you can be successful and steadfast. Not everybody likes it that you want to do right. Not everybody likes it that you have convictions. And so imagine if they could tell us, here the mad people begin to lay a hold of them. Think of the sounds, burn them. Burn them alive. You really think they're going there? Yeah, no problem. I dare you. You really think that? Do you really, really think that? And that that's not enough. Matter of fact, burn them alive, but make it seven times hotter. Fry these dudes. These are good people. These are right people. They're snatched up. They're thrown into this fire. Did they see the first miracle that those that threw him in were killed? And they're still here. Turn to somebody and say, we're still here. <laughs> Think about that. They were thrown into a real fire. The fire is all around them. They're in the fire. The only thing that is burning are the ropes that are binding them. Their skin, yeah, their skin is untouched. What in the world is going on? And then all of a sudden, out of the smoke, out of the ashes, comes some shiny being. Comes a godsend. Are you with me? We're in the fire. Those that put us in, they died. This is real. But out of the smoke and the ashes, the least expected place, the most dangerous and vulnerable place. Some, a godsend, came out of the smoke and ashes. He never told them their name. Matter of fact, he didn't say anything. And after a while, he just left. Like he showed up, they never saw him again. So what are you saying, Brother Meyer? What is Job saying? What is the secret? Well, not only were they not alone, the secret is on the left-hand side. How many know God's got a plan to reach people, and sometimes it's not the plan that you and I think? The left-hand side, God says, I'm going to do something more. The secret is there's a lot of important people watching you. Woo! They're sitting there going, hmm, they should have died, but they didn't die. They should have renounced God. They should have ran for their lives. They should have cowered in, but they didn't. They went into the fire. Very important people were watching. There's important people that are watching you and I. The most trying time of their life, their whole life ahead of them. But let me tell you something, friends. Even though we can't see God, God always sees us. The secret is coming. Here it is, Daniel 3, 28 and 29. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent who had a God send, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. They have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any God except their own God. Even though they're wondering and questioning, why would you do this? How could you let something happen to me? Verse 29, therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, and language which speaks anything amiss against God the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut into pieces. Their houses shall be made an ash heap. Why? Because there are no other God who can deliver like this God or their God. <laughs> now, we want to reach people. But I'm telling you, to be honest, if they're going to have a conversation, God and the devil, please don't consider me. Come on, somebody. I want to reach him, but I don't know if I want to reach him like this. God's got to help us. 
Think about this. The left hand experience saves a king, saves a people, saves a nation. Through a left hand experience, through the least expected place, through the wicked place, can you say amen? And what they tried to say, it was survival. God says it's not survival, it's called revival. He didn't remove the fire, he just went there with them and he goes there with you and I. We can move three chapters these are familiar Bible, but they're not just Bible stories. These are real people and real circumstances. We read in Daniel chapter six, or, uh, uh, chapter 6, he goes on and listen, here is Daniel. I wonder if he could come up and say, Daniel, tell us about this lion den experience. I don't know about you, but I've been in Mombasa, Africa. And where they had that bridge and those man-eating lions that eight that they know of, well over a hundred people. Lions eat people. This is not Lion King. <laughs> they know. They've developed an appetite to eat people. They're kept hungry to eat people. I'm sure they're going, okay, this is getting serious right now. Why would you let something like that happen to us? God, why would you do that to us? Why? I'm living right. You even set me above other people. Said I was a person of an excellent spirit. Why in the world would it involve a lion's den with me? Laws were changing in the land, but not Daniel. They couldn't find any charge or fault in him because he was faithful. So in all of that, many times you can be shocked. You're doing what's right. You're living for God. You're staying the course. Why are these things happening to me? And God, why would you let these things happen to me? Again, the left-hand experience teaches us another secret. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 22, look what he says. My God sent his angels, another God sent, and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me. Why? Because I was found innocent before God. And also, O king, I have done nothing wrong before you. God shows up again in the least expected place. It's still a lion's den. You're still in a lion's den. God just went there with you. He didn't remove it. Don't you wish God would just remove this stuff? Just take it all away. Like some fuzzy bath soap. Or just take it all away. <laughs> You're going to wake up real soon and find out that's not real. Again, the secret is some very important people are watching him. Daniel 6, 25 and 27, then King Darius wrote to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. Hallelujah. He's a God that is steadfast forever, and his kingdom is the one is the one which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall endure to the end he delivers and he rescues and he works signs and wonders in the heavens and the earth who has delivered daniel from the power of the lions again this left-hand experience turns a king turns a people and turns a nation and over the years i've had some people and say you know what uh, how, how did you make it through that? Why didn't you quit? You should have thrown in the towel. I don't want to have any, you know, crybaby stories or whatever. But that left-hand experience, you don't realize my wife was watching me. My young son, when we first went out, I crumbled up a cheesy handwritten ruler and pencil flyer. I only had six. Baptist preacher said, son, if that's all you got, go home. I looked at that, I'm thinking, what in the world is little old me doing? And God spoke to me, your son is watching you. The secret is your son has his eye on you right now. In this state, in this circumstance, did I feel good? Absolutely not. Did I feel alone? Absolutely did I feel brokenhearted? You better believe I did. 
I reached down, I picked it up, it's in my office today. That little boy is now the assistant pastor preaching to nations in the world. I didn't realize my wife was watching me long after I got away from the pulpit. Honey, I thought you were going to quit. I thought you were going to throw in the, the towel. The secret. I get letters from my kids today. Dad, it's not always what you preached across the pulpit. It's how you live life in the most difficult times of your life. The reason I follow that man speaks incredible sermons. And I'm not discounting any of that. But what impresses me about that man is that left-hand experience. He didn't quit. Dried his tears. Stood back up. Realize that God doesn't just remove you from all the fire and tribulation and hardships. He just went there with you. I never knew on Christmas one day, precious couple sitting here right now, Christmas morning their baby died on Christmas. I remember getting the phone call. I remember rushing to the hospital. I remember thinking, God, how could you let something like this happen? They're such a good couple. But I'm going to tell you something. Today, they have a validity to their word, their testimony. Their family cannot deny there's something genuine deep inside of them. There has to be a living God, a God who rescues and delivers and protects. Important people we're watching. Brother Myron sits here. After an evening in a play, his teenage son gets hit by a drunk driver. He died. His other son is a walking miracle. They didn't think he was going to make it. And you're saying, God, how could, why would you let this happen? But nobody realized the secret, which Job's trying to help it. There's some very important people watching. The very two guys that hit his sons, drunk, speeding. You want to know who Myron went to talk to? The ones that killed his son. The father, and he says, I'm glad it was my son. Because my son was saved and yours aren't. You want to talk about radical? Whew. Today, schools are open. Come in and speak. Come and share where you get your strength. Come and share where you find help and hope. Come and tell us, amen, when we think nobody's around, God is there. Doors have opened up everywhere. He cannot even go in all the places it's offered. The left hand reveals a secret. Job wants to reveal a secret. Let's wind this down. In reality, the hour of crisis, many of us try to find rest instead of answers. Because there's questions, God, where are you? And we need to get this settled. You should be ahead of me. You should be on the right side of me. You should be behind me. But God, I don't see you there. But Job teaches us something when you least expect it, when you're weak beyond description, when you feel like you're all alone, God is always closer than you think. Hallelujah. There's always a godsend. It has changed my life. There's times that I go through anymore. Do you hate them? Absolutely. Do I pray them to go away? Absolutely. That's usually my first prayer. But how many of you doesn't always answer that prayer? But in those kind of hard times and living life or whatever it is in ministry, I remember hard times in ministry when we won a handful of people. I loved them. I thought, God, we're, things are moving. And then all of a sudden, some wicked people took the entire congregation out. God, where are you? Why could you let something like this happen to me? But God is ministering to some very special people. Because you really can't just pastor on the mountaintop all the time. Some of the greatest wealth of your Christian testimony and ministry is not always on, and hardly ever on the mountaintop. It's in the valley. You know, before I got saved, I refused to cry. 
absolutely, I don't care what you do, I'm not going to cry. You see, the devil wants to take a broken heart and try to convince it to become a hard heart. But when I got saved, God took that hard heart and he broke it again. I don't know about you, but there's some moments in this conference where God, I said, whatever you need to do, break my heart that you can remold it, refashion it, teach me some things. Some of the greatest lessons in my life were left-hand experiences. You know, Paul had to learn this. Paul didn't become all that he was without left-hand experiences. Paul shares with the church, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He had to learn this. He didn't get to where he is without left-hand experiences. And he, God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect. Where? In weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in what? In my infirmities. What for? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see, it's not enough to read about it. It's not enough to hear somebody else talk about it. I needed God to show up when I least expected him to show up. I needed God to just come out and come forward. I needed a God send when I thought there is nothing and it's hopeless. But let me tell you some another secret. He's going to move in another dimension. He's going to move with another hand. God's got to change another hand to show you something more about him. And not only more about him to you, but more about him to the devil. Hey, devil, you considered my servant, Pastor Kemble? Done your worst, huh? Beat him up pretty bad, huh? God wants the devil to know also, when you do your worst, it still will not conquer God's best. God's not only sharing his secret with us, he's teaching the devil a lesson. <laughs> Man, I really like it when he gets his boot tie spanked. I really do. <laughs> I'm going to close. I remember a time as God was laying this upon my heart because I want to help you. Great week of revival. Great week of conference. Message after message after. And we feel pretty good right here. But when we leave here, we have to go home and face some things. You got mindsets. You know, it hasn't been really good so far. Haven't seen a lot of results. God, where are you? He needs to show up in those places. We recently have had two great pastors that I love dearly out of our church. Ten years probably or better. They've only been able to see a handful of people, and I've heard them on the phone before and just cry out to God, Am I doing something wrong? Why isn't God bringing growth? Where, where, where is all the work? Where's the blessing? Not a special revival. Not an outreach team. All of a sudden, somehow, somewhere, a Sunday morning, 32 people just happened to show up. He didn't expect it. The other baby pastor pioneering... I mean, these are good guys. They're outreaching. They are laboring. They're working hard. They're praying. They're fasting. All of a sudden, somehow, comes 19 people Sunday morning into his service. Not a big outreach. Not a big advertisement. God just shows up. In closing, I have a heart for the Dominican Republic. For years, we went there and took teams. And this came to my memory just like it was yesterday. I remember when we took a team in and we were going to go with a missionary there. And, and uh, you know, it's the Caribbean area and they're really, really beautiful areas. And I said, well, let's take the, everybody swimming. And it's hot. And I'm going, okay, that sounds really good. We went to this place. Some of you know, I think Pastor Rosario knows exactly what I'm talking about. Huge waterfall. And you're looking, man, that is incredible. And then you're thinking, here's the second layer where we're going to swim. All that water is falling into this. Well, where is it going? And then you see this whirlpool off in the corner. Good God-given common sense says, stay away from that area. A good friend of mine, 
got too close. Just like it was yesterday, I can see his eyes, the fear. How violently that whirlpool just got him and violently sucked him down. He's gone. I can still see him today. And I'm thinking, man, well, man. I can't just leave him without trying. Was, I was terrified. I already saw the results of that kind of decision. What good can come out of that? What is two dead men better than one? I couldn't just leave him without trying. I remember looking at my wife. She is screaming out, no, stop him, stop him. He was my friend. I was terrified. How can that happen? God, we're here helping a church, a pastor, whatever. He's gone. And I remember the moment I got close to that whirlpool, how violently it sucked me down, slammed me into this underwater cavern. Couldn't have been very big. I remember I went to stand up and hit my head, split the top of my head open. I, I can see the green water and the murky things just swirling around me. I remember from the bottom to the top and all the way around, I'm feeling all the sides. There's no opening. It was like it's impossible to escape. How would I know I'm confident? In my salvation, there was a peace, unexplainable. I knew in a few moments I'm going to step into eternity, but I wasn't afraid. How would I ever known that? That experience taught me. How would I know well, who'd take care of my wife and my kids? I had a clarity and a surety. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. I began to gulp water. I begin to just prepare myself. And can I tell you one of the greatest things that changed my life? I had already gone around it, felt, whatever. I'm gulping water and over to my left side. All of a sudden, a little bit of light showed up there. I believe it was a godsend. I'd already felt my way all the way around it and whatever. And I thought, well, there's light. There's, it's got to be coming from somewhere. Maybe I could get through that. I remember swimming through that light, and then the light got bigger and bigger and bigger until all of a sudden there was light all around, and I remember going to the top. Somehow, some way, on the left side, God gave me a godsend. Are you with me? Job with all his bitterness, arguments, frustration with the why, 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 why. <laughs> he says these incredible words. And I'm learning that secret. I'm learning such a valuable, loving God. Because he doesn't always remove all the hard things. There's a bigger plan. There's a bigger picture. And he's reminding the demonic also, even through your life, who he is and who he is in you. And he says this in verse 10. But he, God, knows where I am and what I've done. He can cross-examine me all that he wants. I'll pass the test with honors. Other translation says, when he's done with me, I'm going to come forth like gold. May not be today. May not be tomorrow. But when he's done with me, I'm going to come forth like gold. Do you know that Job has an interesting name? His name means the weeping one. That's radical. But attaches with that the weeping one who he turns. The weeping one who he turns. Listen to me. I know there's people here. It's heavy. It's frightening. It's hard. You have felt it's a make it and break it moment. You feel good right now. But let me tell you something. In a few moments, it's going to grip you. We've got to go back to real Christian life and spiritual warring and enemies. Are you with me? Problems and on and on. Listen to me, the devil always wants to lie to you. There's no hope, there's no help coming. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Can you say amen? He will always bring you a godsend, and it's so wonderful when he brings it in front of the devil and everybody else watching in the weakest, most vulnerable, and least expected place. Somehow he always shows up and said, I didn't take it away, but I went there with you. <laughs> Hallelujah. God's with you. 
God send and God send. Amen. Let Job help us. I want to ask you to bow your heads and your hearts as the musicians would come quickly. Left-hand experiences have changed my entire Christian life. They have changed my ministry. They have changed my marriage. They have changed in times of brokenness and heartbreak. They've always shown me that God always has a God send. And even in my broken heart, he'll help me and help you that it won't become hard-hearted. God's there for you. And the problem is many times we look for him in all the wrong places. He's here right now for you. Maybe you're here tonight in this place and you've come and you're not right with God. Your life is filled with all kinds of brokenness, pain, suffering, bondages, habits, mistakes are attached to you. You feel so alone and defeated. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ is God's God sent. He sent his son, perfect. He sent his son to save the worst sinner. Say, well, pastor, I've done too much. I've gone too far. You're never out of reach of God. I've been up and down so many times. You're never out of God's love and God's help. You've backslidden. You've backslidden. Maybe you got mad at God. You said, God, this is enough. This is not right. It's not fair. So you turned your back and you began walking away from God. Listen to me. He's sending you a godsend right now. His arms are open. He's here for you. You may not see him, but he sees you. You know you need to get saved, but you have to want to. You know you need to repent, but you have to want to. God is sending his spirit to help tug on your heart. He's binding the lies of the enemy. He's bringing light, hope, and help. And all he's waiting for you to say, God, it's, now's the time I'm saying yes to you. I'm going to repent of my sin. I'm turning back. I'm coming back to you, God. Enough is enough. If you would help somebody like me, God, here am I. You're in this place. Heads are bowed. You'd lift your hand where I could see it. You'd hold it up in this place saying, yes, unto God. I see that hand, that hand. Over here in the back, I see that hand. Others, hold your hand up where I could see it. God sees you. God cares for you. You're not left alone. You don't have to handle all that brokenness and pain on your own. God has a godsend. It's Jesus Christ. Others, lift your hand and say, Pastor, remember me in prayer. Come on, there's a man in here. You are right there at the crossroads. God's Spirit is dealing with you. Don't wait another day, another moment. Lift your hand and say, I'm going to get right with God tonight. God's got a miracle for you. God's got a brand new beginning, a new start. Lift your hand and say, I want to join these. Here's my hand. Here's my hand. Remember me in prayer. God, I see that hand. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you in the middle. Thank you. God bless you. God's going to show himself to you. You're going to meet. You're going to meet a God sent, somebody who loves you, doesn't give up on you when you make mistakes, never leaves you the way he finds you. I see that hand. God bless you. You lifted your hand tonight. I want to ask you to lift your hand again right now. Lift it up. Hold it up. Yes. I want you to stand to your feet right now if you would. Stand to your feet. You're taking a step of faith right now. I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to come. I want you to come and meet us up front here. Some people are going to pray with you and for you. God is going to do a miracle. God is going to show you that he's real. God is going to show you that he is with you. God is going to again show you that it's not hopeless. You feel so weak. You feel so broken. He's going to show you he's here. You'd come, others. Come on down. Come on. We want to wait for you. Come on. Just keep coming. God bless you. Sir, ma'am, God bless you. Dad, come on. Mom, come on. Young person, come on. Just come. Just come. Just come. I want to ask you to lead them in a sinner's prayer. I want you to say from your own heart, God, I'm sorry. God, I really do want to repent. Somehow, some way, God, I believe that you could forgive somebody like me. Your sin is not greater than his salvation. He loves you. And he's going to do a miracle in your life. I want to open this up very quickly to the church. Some of the most courageous things I've ever seen in my life 
Oh, when people should have gave up, should have thrown the towel. There's people here, you're such a testimony. I was so moved by Brother Dave Eccles. I was shocked when I watched him walk up the aisle of the Chandler Sanctuary. Time and time and time again, he's been sick and afflicted. I watched him go into the children's church. I watched Frank Cooper and them lay their hands and pray for him. And then I didn't even know he came back in. And they called on him to close in prayer. He's still here. He's still here. That's pretty radical. Our pastor, I believe with all of my heart, God gave him a left-hand experience. He gave us a left-hand experience. That even the most terrifying, difficult, vulnerable times in our life, God has a God sent. I want to ask you, God's moved on your heart. I want to ask you to get out of your seat if you can or turn at your seats. I want to take a quick moment and pray before we go on tonight. We have a lot of business to take care of. When I ask you, amen, to talk to God. God, I so thank you. God, you're always present. God, even when we can't see you, you always see us. Your eye is always upon us in every detail. God, I thank you that in all our failures, you're greater. In all our struggles, you're stronger. In all the demonic strategies and weapons formed against us, God, you're with us. We may not know why you don't remove them, but God, may we learn that you'll always go there with us. In a world, Lord God, where there's so much shallow Christianity, may we be those people in those hard times, enduring that hardship in the evil day. God, as they're watching us, Yes, God, we're pilgrims. This is not our home. We're traveling through, but you have put it on us on the stage of life. God, may they see you. May see they see the God who rescues and saves. I want to sing this out very quickly if we can, if you would, please. Very quickly. Very quickly. Oh, yes, God, you can. You are able. God, turn it around. Show yourself. God, turn it around. Help us find you, God. God, turn it around. Help us learn of your goodness, God, in these places. Calling on the name. Shekarama Sibe Changes everything. Oh, God, I pray for these. Turn it God, around. you and you alone God, know all turn that's involved. God, all, all their entanglement. And you are, you're the God of salvation. You're the God of healing and deliverance. You're the God who rescues. Oh, God, you're the faithful God, the overseer, watching caretaker. Oh, God, you're always there. God, minister to them, I ask. Turn this thing around. Oh, yes, 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 God. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. He will. He will. I'm calling on the Oh, yes, he will. Thank you, Jesus. changes everything. God, over and over again, I thank you. God, I'm failing. Faithful Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you. Sing it out. God, we believe you somehow, some way. Oh, God, turn it around. Let them see you. Let's be grateful, amen. Give him praise as Pastor would come.
God, praise you tonight. You, God, we thank you and praise you. God, we thank you in this place tonight. Amen. You may return to your seat. You may return to your seat. <clears throat> Again, while you're returning to your seat, uh, we just really 